Welcome back to another episode of Lakewind, A Community Lost. This is Matt Carl from Leroy Heritage Museum, and today we're going to be talking about the kindling wood mill that was located in Lakewind. Now, the kindling wood mill was officially known as the Schrader Wood Company. It was a subsidiary of the Standard Wood Company, and it was owned by the Blaisdell family of Bradford, Pennsylvania. Uh, Joseph Blaisdell was president. Now, kindling wood companies were usually located right next to uh, a sawmill in a lot of these lumber towns. Um, not all lumber towns had them, but Lakewind did. The purpose of the Kindling Wood Mill being located next to the sawmill was very important. It was done that way intentionally because the extra trimmings and uh, edgings from the sawmill that were not used for any other purpose could be sent on a conveyor straight out to the Kindling Wood Mill and used there to make these uh, firewood bundles. These bundles were used in the cities, oftentimes, uh, in tenements where people could not just go out and chop firewood in their own backyard. Uh, these people had to buy bundles in order to start fires in their kitchen stoves. And so this was a very needed product at this particular point in time. Now the Kindling Wood Mill had two separate buildings, each with a distinct purpose. The first building was uh, smaller than the second, in the first building, the pieces of wood would be cut to a uniform size so that they would be able to fit into a uniform size bundle. Uh, the bundles were often uh, oval in shape, but a certain number of pieces usually would fit into a bundle. So these pieces of wood were cut inside of that first building. Uh, inside the building also there were uh, steam boilers in the basement section of the building in order to create steam for... Uh, what was going on in the next building. So in the next building, which was much larger, and when you see pictures of Lake, when you'll see a, a large, almost looks like a tower. It's uh, much larger than the first building is. And uh, it has a conveyor that runs up to the top of it from the first building. And so these cut pieces of wood would go on the conveyor up to this top of the second building and would be dropped down inside into uh, a series of steam pipes and these steam pipes kept it very hot inside so that it would dry out uh, these pieces of wood of course the wood uh, coming in was freshly cut uh, brand new wood so to make it kindling wood they had to dry it out and then once it had dried out worked its way down to the bottom where the bundling stations were located there were 25 bundling stations on each side of the building. The bundling operation consisted of laying a tarred rope in the bundling frame and placing a label on it. Next, the wood was piled in the frame, and then the bundler could step on the pedal to squeeze it tight. They would tie a rope with a square knot and set the bundle aside. They were small, approximately a foot long, and six inches wide and six inches high, and weighed approximately two pounds. Now it was said that a good bundler could do about a hundred per hour and a record was 1800 in one day and during the years that Barclays ran the sawmill a uh, half million bundles were regularly shipped each month uh, which was approximately one freight car of bundles a day. So it was a pretty significant amount of kindling wood moving through this um, mill and being shipped out to cities in the Northeast. Now, the Kindling Wood Mill employed a lot of women and young people, and uh, these women worked 11-hour shifts, and they were paid by how many bundles of kindling wood they could produce during the day. Uh, most of the women working there were young. Some were about 20 years old, so it was also a good place that you could get a job if you were one of the older girls in school. Grace Saxton worked for a time at the Kindling Wood Mill, and she had remembered bundling kindling wood to be sent to New York City. She said she was paid 28 cents per 100 bundles of wood and was disgusted when she drew her first week's paycheck of $1.28. And because many of her bundles were tied with loose knots, she had been docked most of her earnings. That was when she said she quit the wood mill and went to work at the hotel for $3 a week. Now the way that these bundles were used in a stove was that in the morning you would grab one of these bundles which was tied with a rope and you would place the whole bundle, rope included, into the stove. There was a tag that was attached to the rope and you would light the tag on fire which would in turn burn the rope 
and then that would set the wood on fire, and that would in turn then uh, set your coal stove uh, working. So it was apparently a good product for those who needed it. The kindling wood mill had to take all of the wood from the sawmill, that the sawmill could send it, and so oftentimes that was more than what was needed, and they would sell off the excess uh, to uh, paper companies. William Beers, who was manager of the plant in 1910, made $3 a day. Minimum pay at that time was $1.65 a day, except for the bundlers who were on piecework. There were three engineers and firemen who manned the boilers and the engine, and six men sawing wood, two men in the bundling room, and three men who loaded slab wood coming from the mill. A majority of these workers were German. Now, the second building was a wooden building with the steam pipes inside. And so with that kind of extreme heat in a wooden building, it was very common for them to catch on fire. The newspaper reported on October 15, 1908, quote, Practically the entire roof of the large kindling wood factory at Lakewood was destroyed by fire Wednesday afternoon. Flames are believed to have had their origin in a spark from the smokestack. The fire started about 1.20, and it was but an instant until the entire roof was a mass of flames. The factory is equipped with patent sprinklers, which immediately commenced action, and four lines of hose attached to a powerful pump were brought to play upon the building. In a very remarkable short time, the fire was out with no greater damage done than the building was left roofless. This is the fifth time this factory has been in flames, only to be saved by the splendid water supply, which gives the Big Lake Wind Mills excellent protection against fire, end quote. The second was well remembered, according to Ghost Lumber Towns of Central Pennsylvania, by Harold Beers. He said, quote, my father was playing dominoes with me that evening, November 16th, 1911, and my mother was at a Rebecca Lodge meeting when we got word at nine o'clock of the fire. A breeze was blowing, and when we looked out, the sky was starting to get red. Sparks were being blown over a wide area. It was impossible to save the factory, and after the fire was out, all that remained was the spaghetti of twisted steam pipes. However, the fire protection system for Lakewind had supplied sufficient water to keep sparks from setting fire to the nearby lumber piles, the sawmill, and a number of homes. Not only had they pumped all the water an 8-inch pipe from the creek could supply, but they also lowered the mill pond by more than a foot that night. Dad came home at noon the next day. Immediately, plans were made to rebuild, and only six weeks later, they were back in operation with a brand new factory, end quote. Now, the Kindling Wood Mill continued to operate even when the original Lakewood Lumber Company's mill shut down, but over time, they would produce uh, less and ship out uh, additional carloads to paper mills. The factory continued until it closed when the Central Pennsylvania Lumber Company decided to sell its slab wood to the paper mills instead of the Kindling Wood Mill. Today, there are still significant ruins of the Kindling Wood Mill. First of all, we're looking at the foundation of the first building in the mill, and the highest uh, part of the foundation would have been the base of the smokestack that would be on that uh, particular building. In the basement, underneath of that section, would have been the boilers, which we'll look at in a minute. You can notice by looking at this view, however, that there's a clean-out section at the bottom of the smokestack, just as there was on the smokestack located at the sawmill powerhouse. Now you can see that the foundation of these buildings was created with concrete, again, just like the major foundations at the sawmill. The section that we're looking at here is the boiler room that would have been at the base of the first building where the two boilers were located. Here we're inside the boiler room and we're looking at one of the boilers there on the right. It's the arched section that's shown there. When I first saw this back in the 1990s, uh, there were actually two arches there. The other one to the right of this one has since collapsed, but there were two boilers inside the basement of this building. Again, this section that we're looking at is inside the boiler room and uh, the walls that make up that section of the building. Now, the next section of the uh, operation, the second building in the factory, uh, was the, the large building that held the steam pipes that dried the kindling wood, and the base of that building is made up of a series of concrete piers that you can see here. As I mentioned in the last video about the sawmill, uh, concrete had been used for a number of years, going back uh, thousands of years in fact, but uh, it had become more popular at this time in history in uh, the building of these major industrial plants. Now let's take a moment to talk about the fire system at Lakewind. Now Lakewind never had a fire department. However, a system of fire protection was installed throughout the valley around the mills. 
The entire town was made up of wooden buildings, and they were miles from any fire protection, and so it was important to provide their own fire protection. A system of water pipes ran underground, and they were connected to a number of hydrants and also hose connections inside the sawmill. An ironclad pump house was located next to the powerhouse for the sawmill, and it was capable of pumping water into the system from the pond. The stave mill and the chemical plant each had 750-gallon pumps. Each industry's fire pumps were linked to a single system so they could support each other in case of a serious fire. Uh, the fire pump was kept running continuously in case a fire should break out. When a fire did break out, the sawmill whistle would give off a series of short beeps, followed by long beeps to give the location of the fire. The men would run to one of a dozen 10 by 10 foot hose houses scattered around town, inside of which was a hydrant, fire axes, and a hose reel on high wheels. More hose was lapped on racks on the wall. This system usually worked well, unless of course the hydrants were frozen, which occurred in the winter time. During the burning of the home of Superintendent McCloskey of the Central Pennsylvania Lumber Company in December of 1922, the hydrant near his home was discovered to be frozen due to the extreme cold weather delaying the ability to fight the fire. Thus, the upper story of the home was destroyed. In case of a serious fire, they could call Tawanda for backup, but this meant a long wait, because what happened was that once they contacted Tawanda, uh, the fire company would have to load their equipment onto a rail car by hand, which would take quite a while to do in and of itself, and then load the men on to the train. The train would have to take off and then make the journey to Lakewin, and so the whole town could be possibly burned down by the time the Tawanda men arrived at Lakewin. And so that was really just a last-ditch effort to fight a fire if it had gotten out of control. Usually that was not the case. Now you can still see evidence of the fire system around Lakewin today, and particularly if you were to look at the valley, uh, the eastern part, from the air. So if you look at Google Maps, it's easier to see at uh, the times of year when the vegetation is off, but you can see an indentation in the ground where the water pipes ran from the sawmill and up toward the stave mill. You can also see some uh, pieces that stick out of the ground that had to do with the fire system. Now, in addition to the fire system that was within town, uh, Watson Barkley, who ran the whole operation uh, during the time that the Lakewind Lumber Company was in operation, he had uh, a system of firefighting in the woods uh, they had a tanker car that was all fitted up to fight fire along the railroad. Now, usually when the railroad was running through the woods, it was uh, easy in those days to start a fire from a spark coming out of a smokestack and landing in leaves or in uh, vegetation that might be dried up. So uh, they tried to prevent that from happening, and Watson Barkley designed a cone-shaped screen that went over top of the uh, smokestack to keep the sparks from spreading. It was called a spark arrester, and it would keep sparks from uh, flying out of the smokestack and landing along the track. If, however, a fire did start, start there was a system of bells that would be rung from the engine which would signal the men to go to work and uh, there were hoses on the tank car they could reach a certain distance into the woods and so they were set up pretty well to fight fires along the track and this was quite an unusual thing for lumber towns to go that far to um, prevent fire uh, along the tracks in the woods and so I think there's something to be said for the work that was done at Lakewind to help prevent fires in town and also out in the woods and along the railroad. And so that's an overview of the Schrader Wood Company and the type of work that they did there in Lakewood. We would invite you to like this video and subscribe on YouTube for future videos. And also, if you're not a member of the Leroy Heritage Museum, we publish a, a semi-annual magazine called The Monogram, and it often features material on Barclay Mountain that is newly written, newly researched, and so we invite you to visit Leroy Heritage heritage.org. Click on become a member and you can do that right online. And in addition to receiving the magazine, there are other benefits and also you're supporting uh, the preservation of local history that's done by the museum. So we thank you for joining us today in this video. Be sure to check out our other videos in the Lakewind A Community Lost series. See you next time.